the One Percenter Podcast with Sam Bakhtiar, bringing you the one percent knowledge to help you reach your full potential. Learn what it takes to rise above the ninety-nine percent and become a one percenter. What's going on, everybody? It's Sam Bakhtiar, the host of One Percent Podcast. And I have a very, very, very special guest. I'm so excited about having Miguel Aguilar in the house. Miguel, what's happening? My man. Miguel Aguilar is a CEO and founder of Self Made Training Facilities. He's just absolutely blown up, changing the fitness industry. And he just found a void in the marketplace. I just cannot tell you how impressed I am with everything that you're doing, man. Thank you, brother. I appreciate that. I appreciate you being yeah, here. Yeah, man. It's, uh, uh, it's been a journey. I'm a big fan of yours, man. You know, we know I follow you and I, and I, and I see what you're doing and I cannot believe what you created. And when, when I saw what you created, I'm like, it made total sense. Yeah. It made, we'll talk about that in a little bit. Yeah. But first, I want to talk to you about your beginnings, yes. about, about growing up and all that kind of stuff. Because I was doing a little research and you already told me a little bit about you and all that kind of stuff. Tell me about growing up, about your childhood and everything that happened. Uh, it's a rough childhood, you know, since, I, yeah. since yeah. day one, since literally since the day I can remember, the age I can remember, my childhood has been completely disruptive uh, in, in many aspects from, you know, my mother being a pathological liar and creating a lot of turmoil within the family. So is that, is, is that your biological mother? Yeah, my biological mother. Okay. She, she, uh, she, she had a lot of mental issues. Didn't know that back then, obviously, because I was so young. Right. And of course, that's my mom. So I'm going to love her regardless. Oh. But she put us in a very negative environment, completely disruptive in every way possibly that you can possibly think of. And so she, she created a lot of bad relationships with our own family so that, you know, they disowned us. And then we moved a lot growing up uh, because of Where the did you racial doing. So I grew up in, in, I was born in Riverside, California. And I grew up in Riverside, California, but I bounced back from Riverside, California, to San Diego County. Uh, but I've lived in every part of Riverside County, every part of San Diego County. It seemed like every time my mom got into some type of trouble, we would have to get up and move. Yeah. So I, I lived in, in Chula Vista, National City, El Cajon. Um, one of the worst parts of San Diego for, for me personally was San Ysidro. I lived in San Ysidro for a good you know, few years, uh, which is right next to the border of Mexico. And so the ima imagine you know, the violence and gangs between drugs and everything else, I was all in that. But I thought that was normal. I didn't think nothing different. Yeah, that, that, that's your environment. You yeah. think that's what the normal day is. Oh, 100%. So looking back now, I understand that was definitely not a proper way to raise your kids. And then by the time I was 12, uh, my mom basically abandoned us. Okay, so I, I read that. You know, you know, I, was, you know, I read your biography, and, and I just can't fathom. Mm -hmm. You know, I cannot fathom a mother abandoning her kids. Yeah. Right. So obviously, like you said, it was psychological. You can't, a normal mother cannot do that because I know me like leaving my kids just to go over the weekend just to go in a seminar or for work. I literally after two days, I'm fucking depressed. I'm depressed. I'm like, I, you know, all I think about is my little girls and, uh, and my kids. So so tell me, how was that to you? Like, how 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 did that feel? Exact same feeling like you're talking about, you know, it, 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 there's no way I would ever imagine in my life that I would be able to leave my kids behind. I know what I see, you know, I see what a great father you are. You're a great husband, great father, great baby. I mean, it looks like you just have it all figured out. You know, is that because, is that because you didn't have that growing up? Uh, it, oh yeah, hundred percent. dude. You have to understand like, I'm doing everything opposite of what my parents did. You know, everything opposite. That was a great learning thing of what not to do. You know? you know, it's so funny. I was just talking about that. And I was just talking about that because in life, you can either be just exactly like your parents and growing up like your family, or you can say, you know what, man? No, no, no. That's the blueprint of what not to do. I'm just going to exactly opposite. And that's what happened to me because, you know, you know, my mom and dad got a divorce when I was three. My dad, and I never saw him again. And, and my mom, I love her to death, man. She's a great person, but she's old school. So I could never go talk to her about anything or anything like that without being judged or condemned or anything like that. So I vowed to myself to be the opposite, yeah. you know, and, and, and there we are. That's why we have so much in common, bro. Yeah, we do. And that's the thing. It's, it's you know, you not being able to go to your mother and, and feeling that type. And so imagine not being able to have a mother, period. Yeah. You know, it's it's just exactly the same same arena if you really think about yeah. it, right? Because even though your mom was present, you still didn't feel that comfortability to be able to go to her. And me personally, I had no mother. So at the age of 12, which is still, you know, my daughter is going to turn 12 this June. Yeah. So 
I know her mental state now and the way she is. I could not imagine her not having her father to go to or even my wife to go to for that motherly advice or that hug. Like we had a scenario last night uh, with one of my daughters, my oldest daughter, actually, Jaden, where she got a text message from one of her friends, uh, you know, threatening her in, in, a, in, a, in a demeanor in, in the sense that it just didn't make sense. And for us, we're how do we address that situation? So imagine not having a mom to go to for those type of situations, you know? So I was able to sit down with her and talk to her and, and evaluate the situation. And obviously there wasn't nothing major, but I was glad I was able to do yeah, that. Yeah, you can intervene and, and, and advise her what to do or what not to do and stuff. And I, you know what, it's funny because my wife now, mm-hmm. you know, she comes from a great close knit family and her best friend is her mother, mm-hmm. you know, which I love, I love. And, and, and for, for the life of me, it's such a foreign thing to me where your best friend, you can talk about anything to your mother and your father where I couldn't do any of that. You know what I mean? And I'm looking at it and I'm like, wow, I'm almost like jealous yeah. of that kind of relationship that she has because I've never had one, yeah. you know? So, so your mother abandoned you guys when you were 11, yeah. right? 11, 12. 11, 12. Yeah. And then what happened after that? You, you had your father around, right? Yeah. So what happened is my father actually the year before disappeared. So your father disappeared. My father disappeared at eleven. Yeah. So I had two dysfunctional parents. Oh, like it wow. wasn't just my mother. So I can't put all blame to her. But a lot of her actions created the reactions of my father. It doesn't make it right. But my father left my mother uh, the year before that she abandoned us. Literally disappeared. Got up and left. Didn't even give anybody pre warning. Didn't tell us that he was you know over the relationship with my mother and just said, hey, Peace out. I'm out of here. Um, which was difficult. Now I have a, a dysfunctional mother and now I have no father to go to. I'm very impressionable. I was 11 uh, years old at that time. Uh, I had nobody at that point. Bro, I'm like, I'm, I'm just, you know, sorry for a second, but I'm just looking at it as like, God, you are a self-made man for real. Yes. You know what I mean? Like for yeah. real. It, like a hundred percent. That's the reason. The self-made. Name. Self-made, you know? And, Damn. And it's more than, than just taking full ownership of what I've created out of the negative situations, right? But we also call it the self-made family, right? Because even though, yes, my father disappeared, I had friends that I was able to kind of relate with. These guys were like my brothers and sisters yeah. or whatnot. So even then at that age, I've always had the opportunity to be able to have good relationships with certain people that I can kind of confide in. They weren't great people at the time because some of them, you know, of course, I mean, members, your environment all, yeah, wasn't that great, right? Yeah. Not that great. So, but yeah, so he disappeared and, and didn't, you know, reappear in our life until about a year later. My mother um, got some information where he was located here in, in, in Riverside. He was in Norco, California. My dad actually a very successful immigrant from Guatemala. A successful man. He owned a bunch of Yum Yum Donuts uh, franchises, and and that's how I kind of know the franchise industry because of my father. And he's a, a workaholic. I mean, literally a workaholic, but he was also an alcoholic himself. So he had a lot of demons he was battling. But he relocated to Norco. My mother got information that he was there. He was at the Yum Yum Donuts off of Hamner in in, River, in, in Norco, California. And we got in the car, drove from San Ysidro down to, to, to Riverside County to Norco, saw him at his donut shop. She got out of the car, went into the, you know, the shop and said, hey, what was going on? We didn't know the whole conversation because she told us to stay in the car, but that's where we reconnected with our dad. Got it, so, 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 so you reconnected with your dad, then your mom bounced. Or not even necessarily right there and there. So my mom, yet again, crazy in the head, right? Um, Reconnected with my father. They had an argument. We come into the store. She finally calls us in. We go into the store. We we say our uh, our hellos. We're stoked to see our dad. Like yeah. super stoked, you know. And Those I haven't kids, seen my man. dad for a yeah. year. We thought he was dead. We didn't know what the, the the hell was going on. Like literally, no interaction or phone call or anything from my father for over a year. Um, so we show up, get reacquainted, and um, my mother tells us, "Hey, get back in the car. We're going to come back and visit your dad later on in the month." Uh, a couple weeks pass, my mom says, hey, pack your stuff, pack lightly, because you're going you're gonna to stay with your dad for a little bit um, while I get some things uh, organized here at home. And I was like, and you haven't visited your father for over a year, so I'm going to let you guys stay with him for a couple weeks. So we pack our stuff, just enough, you know, for a couple weeks. We pack our stuff. We drive back to Riverside County. We meet uh, my dad in Corona at the park. And my mom tells us, hey, go play. 
go handle some business and then let us let us handle some business. Uh, they're arguing again, but we're at the playground, so we don't know what's going on. And then she calls us over and says, okay, you're going to stay with your dad for a couple of weeks. I'll come back and pick you guys up. Um, and that was our understanding. Mom was going to come back. And yeah, pick us that, up. Was, that was it. So we didn't think anything of it. And then she disappeared, never came back, dude. Like literally disappeared. So, so to this day, she disappeared? So, like, about I mean, eight months ago. Oh, yeah. Wow. <laughs> eight months ago? Talk about my life being completely like fucked up and upside down. Like, literally, even to this day, I still get haunted by my past. Um, eight months ago, roughly, give or take, uh, through social media, through Facebook, I get this random phone call of, uh, it said Aguilar in the last uh, name, but it was just no first name, just phone call, phone call after phone call. Well, I still have family in San Diego, so I was assuming it was family out of San Diego uh, through Facebook. It was a Facebook call, Facebook call, and I kept ignoring it, kept ignoring it because I thought it was family from San Diego that wants either something from me or who knows. Oh, well, yeah, you know what? Hey, man, yeah, Miguel, Miguel, Miguel made it, yeah. man. Let's call him. Yeah, yeah, what's up? Let me get my 10%, you know? Yeah. Um, and, and so I ignored it, but then it kept persisting throughout the day, and then I finally picked up I said, uh, you know, and I answered. I said, you know, good afternoon, and I, I pretended like I didn't know who it was. And it was my aunt on the other line. And she, I haven't connected with her in 20 plus years. When our mom abandoned me and all this situation happened where I became homeless at 16, never once did a family member call and say, hey, come stay with us, or hey, let us help you out, or here's some money, or anything. So when I get this random call, I'm thinking, okay, what do they want and why are they calling me? So she calls and, and she says, hey, you're not gonna believe who's, who's here with me. And I was like, who? And, and she was like, your mom. My heart literally sank, like sank. So, so this is like, literally like. 20 years later, dude. God. Yeah, or more actually, 25 years later. Wow, I'm mad, okay. So I'm thinking it's a joke. And I'm thinking like automatically in my head, cause I always think someone's out, always, always out to get me like when it comes to family yeah. for some reason, like they want something because they were never around before. So I have no other relationship with them besides that. And I thought, oh, they're gonna put some lady on the phone. Like I'm thinking, what do they want? They want money, they want, they, who, what are they trying to con me out of? And as soon as she got on the phone and she starts talking right then, I was like, that's my mom. You know, you can never forget your mom's voice. And she's crying and I'm trying to make sense of what she's trying to tell me. And I'm like telling her to calm down. And then I break down and I'm like, holy fuck, what just happened? You know, 25 years later, my mom reappears in my life. Um, and, and the sad part is I already knew what was going to be asked. You know, I need, I need some help. And I'm like, man, I was like, couldn't you wait at least a week? You know, wait a week, then ask me for some money or, or whatever the case. That sucks. Yeah. Because then want, want, it makes you wonder, like, did she really want to connect with you or did she connect with you because she needed something? She's in a bad place. Well, fuck, I mean, I mean, like, oh, man, okay, man. Think about it, 25 years later, man, all this time, I've been in, in on Facebook since it originally started because of my real estate career, so I've always been promoting myself and the companies and the things that I do, so I've never been hidden from anybody. Anybody can Google my name and you'll see everything about me, or at least get my contact information, especially when I was selling a lot of real estate. My phone number's everywhere, yeah. right? Um, but 25 years later, and then it's because she's in a rough situation, so... Fortunately, at that time, eight months ago, uh, give or take, you know, my faith's always been involved. You've got to give people grace. No one's perfect. I get that. Uh, and I told her, hey, I forgive you for everything that you've ever done. And then we're still to this day trying to develop a relationship. Um, and, you know, and of course, I did send her money, but it's it's it, it's an awkward situation right now. That right there, I'm not, that's a, a, another. Have you seen her yet? Have you gone to see her? No, I haven't. You haven't seen her yet? No, because I, I don't trust me going down there because I don't know what the outcome's gonna be. Um, we've talked over the phone, we've Skyped over the phone or, or uh, uh, chat conversations. So yeah, so I'm, a, I'm able to see her. She's not in a very good condition. Uh, she's not very healthy. Um, and she's deteriorated, you know, she's, she's an older lady now. She's not the same mother that left us 25 years ago or plus. Um, so it, it's, that's another challenge imagine, in my life right now. Imagine the regret that she has. Yeah. Imagine that. Yeah. I mean, that's a heavy burden. I mean, you can be healthy, but if you have that kind of regret, yeah. you know, you know, abandoning your kids and not seeing your kids for 25 years, and all, 
that that by itself would deteriorate your health. And and it's it's um and I understand where she's coming from and I get like I, I have kids of my own. I still can't, you know, see that every No, time. no, like, no. I don't I'm care how bad no. life is. Like there's ways around it. I can't see um, that. Um so for me to, to to I forgive, but I can't forget. Put it that way. Of course, of course. And and, and she's done that's another thing. I have a beautiful family now and I'm trying to protect my family. Yeah. I'm the man of the house trying to protect my family. So to include her back into my life right now, I don't want to do that to my kids nor my wife. Oh, no, I totally get that, man. I mean, um, you know, I, gosh, man, you know, you're going to make me go somewhere that I haven't gone publicly. You know, I don't have the greatest relationship with my mom. Yeah. You know, and not that, you know, she abandoned me. She did the best that she could, mm -hmm. you know, but she never evolved coming to the U.S. Mm -hmm. You know, she's still a very old school, old mentality Persian lady mm -hmm. that, you know, she didn't agree with my first wife. When I first got, you know, we, we, we got engaged, you know, my, my first wife is black and French. And she straight up told me that, you know, um, she doesn't want to have black grandchildren, wow. you know, and she came to my wedding for my first wedding. And mm -hmm. she's like, this is the most ghetto wedding I've ever seen. I'm like, well, that's all I could afford at that time, mm -hmm. you know. And then this time around, you know, she she told my wife, she's like, well, Sam didn't ask me permission to marry you. And I don't approve of it, you know, and, and I'm like, I'm 45 years old, man. I don't think I need everyone's permission. Yeah. So after a while, I totally get what you're saying because you have your own little family and your job is to protect that. Yes. At a certain point, you say, you know what? I love you, mom, but I'm going to love you from far away. Yeah. You know, you know, I, I, you know, I don't understand, understand you, but I don't need to understand you. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I'm, I'm like you said, I'm here financially for you. Yeah. You know, I won't let you know, I, you know but I, I won't be able to give you my mind yeah. or my family and all that kind of stuff. I totally get that, man. For me, it's like... Um... You know, she's been dead a long time ago. You know, after a couple of years of not hearing her, you assume she's yeah. dead. And some of the things that she did in the past led, it would lead me to think that somebody would want to hurt her because of the things yeah. she was doing uh, fraudulently and everything else. You know, I, I've, I've said this before in other podcasts, and it's like she, she, she would fabricate stories, like literally. Yeah, she, didn't she fabricate? My you, death. Your death, yeah, your death. My death. You know, straight told told me to sleep in the closet because we used to live in Pearl Beach at this time and I, I love boogie boarding. I've said this before, I, I, like I love the ocean, I love boogie boarding, uh, but I was really overweight and I, would, I, I had man boobs. Um, so I would get these rashes on my chest because I had a really cheap big boogie board, but I still would boogie board my heart out because that's what I loved. So she promised me and conned me and say, hey, if you sleep in the closet, I'll give you a rash guard and a boogie board. And I was like, oh, stoked, you know, I'm like nine years old, give or take. Uh, I was like, hell yeah, I'll sleep in the closet. What for? But okay, you know, and then she tried to tell me, explain to me, you know, there's people coming over and I need the place to be really quiet. If it gets really loud or you hear the doorbell ring, just stay in the closet. Just don't, don't come out. Wow. And uh, so I, <laughs> she sets up my whole closet. I go in there, I fall asleep. And uh, of course I get woken up by the doorbell rings. And then I really get woken up when I start hearing people cry hysterically and calling out. My nickname used to be, uh, or they used to call him Miguelito. That's in Spanish, like little Miguel. And um, the, I was hearing people crying, saying that name out loud. And I was like, what the hell? So I'm curious and I peek and I hear them slightly because it wasn't a big house in Impro Beach. And I can hear them and they're conversating of how I died, I got hit by a car, and that my mother needed money for the funeral, if they could help her out in any way. Uh, she had my brother involved in the lie and had him crying, and, and it was literally a whole fabricated story to, to con my family into giving her money to pay for my funeral. Um, and of course, they found out I didn't die. I wake up the next day, I still didn't get my boogie board. Unfortunately, it was fucked up, you know? Uh, but dude, it's like all this for, 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 for money. She had this obsession with money, even though we were doing okay, decent, we're always poor because my dad worked his ass off, but it, it's, um, she, she had to have all this cash on her. She would get ways to get people to pay her for certain things. Um, and it was unfortunate, you know? Yeah, that's, that's it. God. So let me ask you something. So is your dad still alive? No. So I don't, I haven't seen my dad since I was 18. Okay. So, so he dropped, so my mom drops us off, right? Uh, we stayed with my dad. My dad at this point in that year, he already remarried and had another kid. And then they had their own little family in Riverside. They drop us off. 
we don't know these people. We don't, you know, he has another daughter. He has two other stepdaughters and then this new wife. Uh, they weren't planning on keeping us, right? They were planning on just letting us stay there for a couple of weeks to get reacquainted with my dad. Come to find out, you know, a couple of years past, we're, we're stuck with them. Uh, so my stepmother at that point, she hated us personally. She hated me personally in a certain way. There's She's like, I didn't sign up for this. You know what I mean? Yeah, I yeah, signed up yeah. for this and at that point. So we get dropped off with my dad. He becomes a heavy alcoholic drug addict. Uh, he still was hustling. He was a functioning drug addict alcoholic. He would still work his ass off. But by the time I was 16, my junior year in high school, going into my senior year, um, my dad cr committed a crime that, that basically landed him in prison for 22 years. Wow. Yeah, they, they sentenced him to 22 years. Um, we uh, are left to, to, to fend for ourselves. My stepmother, the day they sentenced him a couple weeks after, um, told us, hey, you, you guys can't stay here anymore. And my reaction was like, what the fuck are we supposed to do? And, and her exact now words. Now you're homeless. Yeah, yeah. She said, figure it out. So we figured it out. You know, slept in our car the very first night, tried to sleep at friends' houses, but it was a school night. We couldn't get nobody to, to let us stay over. Uh, so by that 16, I was literally homeless, like literally homeless. Like, I'm not saying I, I didn't have a, 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 an aunt or an uncle to go to. Like, I was homeless. We were homeless, me and my younger brother. And we lived in the ghetto of Riverside. So we had no money. I had a little side job. I was working at Contempo in the, in the mall, selling women's clothing. So I made a little money doing that. I can't even see that. Yeah, dude, it's nuts. Best job ever, though, because it taught me to come out of my shell. I am, I'm actually really, I uh, was really shy, you know, because I was really overweight growing up. And, uh, and I was bullied uh, when I was growing up. I can't up. see that because I see, I see your pictures right now all shredded, my arms and everything. Dude, so. yeah, I was, that, that's why I love health and fitness. It changed my life in many aspects. And a lot of people don't know that. And, and I should actually post more about it because I really was overweight. I was four foot nothing. I weighed 180 pounds. Uh, I would go swimming with a shirt on because I didn't want no one to see my, my man boobs, even though they saw it because the shirt, you know, stuck to my skin. I wasn't very smart then, I guess, you know, but I, I was always bullied growing up uh, because I was overweight. But by the time I was 16, I was literally homeless, dude, like really, really homeless. And we fend for ourselves. And, and funny or not, uh, yesterday, I, I finally ran into uh, through social media. We, we stayed in contact, but I finally got to see him in person. Uh, was Chris Gillespie, one of my, my best friends, one of my good, good friends in high school. Um, when this all happened, when my father got incarcerated and I was living from, from friend to friend, to home to home, uh, living out of my car, wherever I could, uh, he found out what happened and he asked his dad if I could stay with him. And this was towards my senior year in high school and um, finally got the chance to tell him thank you yesterday in person, which was pretty cool. I posted about it on my, on my Instagram. Um, but me and him reconnected and talked yesterday and uh, face to face. But if it wasn't for that, man, I, I probably wouldn't be here today in a sense, because there's, there's, you know, for, or, he graduated in 97. I graduated in 2000. This happened in 1999. He came, he graduated, he came back as the assistant wrestling coach. And we always were, you know, the wrestlers, we're all like brothers, like literally brothers. That was my family. The only reason I graduated high school in all reality is because of wrestling. I had something to go back to. That, that kind of saved your life. Oh, big time. Yeah. You know, wrestling, it, by far, in my opinion, is one of the best sports that, that can really develop a young man or woman in, into being completely successful. Well, man, I'll tell you right now, man, there's a couple of times I just did wrestling practice. The conditioning, it kicked my ass. They're, they're, they're in tremendous shape. It, you're literally using every part of your body not to get pinned you know you're not to you're, you're and then the the beautiful part about the sport it's that you're still in a team atmosphere right it's still a team you still all wrestle as a duel in a meet but when you wrestle individually on that mat that that's you you and the other opponent yeah. and you're there to really my that's another reason why i saved my life i got all my aggression out through wrestling yeah. you know i went in there to try to destroy the other opponent and what was cool is as soon as i beat him i shook his hand afterward yeah. You know, and then, okay, we're on to the next. Gosh, man, that's, that, that's crazy. So at some point, you know, so you, you were wrestling. After high school, what did you do? So after high school, uh, I was stoked to graduate, barely graduated high school, and I ended up getting into commercial plumbing. First, I was trying to go to the, the military. I was going to join the Army. I decided not to do that. Um, couldn't handle somebody telling me what to do. It just wasn't, wasn't for me. It's something I literally took the test when took the physical, all I had to do was sore in, sign the paperwork and I was going to get yeah. shipped off. 
Uh, but I decided not to do that. I got into commercial plumbing and got into construction um, because I, I, I didn't get a scholarship. I got hurt my senior year in my state meet and I wasn't able to get a scholarship. I got a, actually a partial, but I still couldn't afford to do that. My original plan, I wanted to be a fireman, you know, and then from there, I was gonna, you know, try to get picked up, but that couldn't happen either because the fire academy was full time at that time and I had to work. Mm -hmm. I had my own apartment by then. Um, I was living on my own. I know what utilities bill were and you know, my grocery bills were, so I had to go work. I had to get into the workforce. Um, so I got into commercial plumbing and um, hated it. You know, I, I hated it with, with the passion, but it's all I could do. I was always good with my hands. I, 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 I love working. I don't mind working. Like, I love work. Well, I can tell you, you work now. Yeah, dude. I'm, you're I'm you're, you're a workhorse. Yeah, you hustle. I, yeah. I see you. But the thing is, is it wasn't getting me to think outside of that. Yeah. You, know? yeah. you, were, just, you were just showing up. You were getting showing a job. Up. And, uh, it, yeah, wasn't, it, it. It, wasn't, it wasn't expanding your context no. or anything like that. And that, I'm a visionary, dude. I love At some point, you got into real estate. Yes. When was that? So that was uh, my third year into to construction. I realized that wasn't for me. And I've always been the individual where if you give me an idea, I'll run off with it. I'm not one to procrastinate yeah. on anything. I had to get into work, go work right away. Find the best paying job, and that's what I'm gonna do. Your speed of implementation, uh, key to success. So, but I hated that job so much that I would complain about it, just like any average you know, 18 to 25 year old yeah. complains about their current situation, right? But a lot of them don't tend to do anything about it. So I uh, would complain about this over and over and I was uh, you know, at a dinner table with a high-end real estate broker. And he would always ask me, how was your work, work week and all that stuff. We, we knew each other from a relationship that I was in at the time. Uh, and I would always complain about my job. So after three or four times of doing that, he finally said, you know, what the fuck are you gonna do about <laughs> yeah, it? Right? I literally straight out called me out and said, well, what, what are you gonna do about it? You complained about it so much, but you're not doing anything about it, it's your fault. I was like, it's not my fault, I just hate it. You know, and it was like, well, what are you gonna do about it? I was like, there's nothing else I can do. That was my mindset back then. I, I wasn't college educated. Uh, and, and you gotta understand, from where I grow up, everything was, you get ready to work a nine to five. This is what yeah, you're gonna yeah, do. Unless sure you're close to college, you're gonna make yeah, six figures. Yeah. Uh, no, that was back then that too. Back yeah. then, you know? And uh, so he, he said, you know, you should try to sell real estate. I was like, what do you mean by that? I didn't know what real estate was at that point. I know construction, but I didn't know real estate. It was like, well, this is what you do. And I, 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 I when, as he was explaining real estate to me, in the back of my mind, I was already like, oh, this guy has a nice home. He has a good family. He has nice cars. He, he's doing really well for himself. I might want to look into that a little further, you know? And I did, I, I, I didn't second guess it. I said, okay, I'll sell real estate. Cause he, was, he, he always would tell me, look, you communicate well, people like you and you're bilingual. It's like, dude, go for it. I was like, what do you have to lose? I was like, exactly, what do I have to lose? So you got into real estate and I know you were just blowing it up. Like, I mean, you didn't even like get into it. You just went in there and just like lit it on fire. My first year I made six figures, you know? And, and, and I made $132,000 in, in real estate. My first two deals that I closed uh, after being licensed it was equivalent to one year's pay as a commercial plumber, so I quit that job. Uh, I didn't even give him two weeks. I literally told him to go fuck off. I'm done. You know, I'm, I'm doing this real estate thing, um, and, and just gave it a hundred percent. Good for and, you. And crushed it. And then, and then, didn't you have at some, some time you had a bunch of people under you yeah, and all that kind so, of stuff? So in real estate, I started off as an agent. I started off at Century Twenty One, right? And then from there, I, I, I was like, I gotta learn. I always, I'm always the, the, the type of individual that if, if I want to do something, I'm gonna learn it. And mortgage industry was, you know, hand in hand with real estate. And this was before all the new laws, but I could do both. So then I was like, oh, so I went to a different brokerage. I only was at, at Century One for slightly because I felt like I was already over exceeding that, that branch. And so I want to learn the mortgage aspect of it as well. So I got into real estate and mortgage. Then I started doing both and I got licenses in both. And I was like, oh, dude, this is. It makes sense, right? I mean, I mean, like, why wouldn't most more people do that? I mean, I mean, it's, it's, yeah, I mean, like, you know, it goes hand in hand. Yeah, it right? Does. Okay. So I got into that and then within a year of doing that together, I was blowing up and I was like, I was a go-to guy. And from there I was like, okay, why work for a broker? Why not be the broker? Why not own my own real estate office? And within three years of being licensed, I opened up my first real estate you're, shop. You're such an entrepreneur. You're, you know, just when you told me 
that you couldn't let anyone tell you what to do. Yeah. That right there, I was like, you're an entrepreneur then. Yeah. You know, you're an entrepreneur, you want to do things on your term, you know, do your own thing, and you, you, you didn't settle at here. You went, you went to, to the next level, to the next level. So then you started blowing up, you know, the real estate, yep. you know, you became a millionaire, yep. you know, and then what happened? So by the time uh, uh, 2011 hit, okay, so I was, I thought I was the man. Uh, like I'm, I'm the real estate king. Yeah, you know, that's yeah. my mentality, been there, man, right? Been there. Pride and ego, 100 percent. Narcissistic, probably there too. You know, and it was unfortunate, but I, I'm glad it, it taught me a, a lot of valuable things of what yet happened afterwards. So by 2011, I ended up opening up my own office. Uh, 2006, opened up my own office. By 2007, 2008, we had the real estate crash. Why everybody was getting out of real estate, right? Trying to go, a lot of my buddies went back to construction, back to because they couldn't do what they were doing in the peak market. Yeah. And me, I said, I was like, let me reevaluate this. I ended up going to University of Phoenix, taking two business courses that I know would help my real estate business out, mm -hmm. learned what I could out of that, and then implemented the systems into the new market. And instead of now going, uh, out of real estate, I went heavier into real estate. So by 2009, I sold 98 homes in one year. So you are a tef true definition of 1%. You went exactly opposite. A definition of 1% it goes against the grain, yep, right? 100%. And I always say like, you know, you know, we're always talking about, you know, you know, Tony Robbins talked about it in, in the book. In, in his book, he says, you know, when is winter time? Mm -hmm. You know, some people are freezing and other people are snowboarding. Yep. You know, it's, it's up to you what you do. Exactly. So you learn how to snowboard in the winter time. Yeah. That's, that's nailed it. Like literally, I, I saw that the market was regressing, but instead of me regressing with the market, let me innovate something completely different and, and, and really go after a different approach of real estate. And I can honestly say I, I'm, I'm one of the, I would say pioneers, or I guess the visionaries where I implemented a lot of videography in real estate. And I'm not talking slideshows. Everybody does slideshows. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you go to my Facebook and you go to my uh, uh, YouTube and you look at videos from 2009, 2000, I'm one of the first that was doing the commercials, one of the first that was doing the, the, the videos of explaining the homes, not just showing you a slideshow. So I started going after a different market, sold 98 homes in one year, Made my first million in 2009, which was a down market. I was 27 years old. You take a poor kid with no, like literally, come from nothing. You give him that. What does he do? He goes harder and harder. But then yet, my ego and pride got the best of me. So by 2011, um, a, I built up my real estate office. I had one of the top producing real estate offices in Southern California, which I own Realty World and Associates. One of the, I bought it into a franchise. And, um, but... I thought that would never go away. And then out of nowhere, by 2011, we had a new real estate brokerage come into the, uh, uh, to the market where they offered 100% flat fee commissions, I mean 100% commissions to real estate agents for a flat fee per month. Wow. So it changed the whole game in the industry. I wasn't ready for that. And instead of me reevaluating that, I, you know, I lost all my 80-20 split uh, agents. I lost all my top producing agents to this flat fee brokerage. So now I had this large overhead because I ended up starting off in a 1200 give or take square foot office. And then I ended up buying the whole building. Um, yet again, I had title, I had escrow, I had everybody in house overextended myself in one small location. Uh, that bit me in the ass. And I learned from that and I took full responsibility cause I wasn't ready. I, I didn't, take the initiative to evolve with the, with the market at that yeah. point. I thought, this is not gonna change. This is you know, me, 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 right? Changed it up. By 2012, I was forced into bankruptcy. You know, and it's, it sucks talking about it because it's the most embarrassing thing that anybody can Bro, go through. You, you know, you look at where you are now. Yeah. You know what I mean? You know, all, everything that's happened to you, I'm just looking back at your whole story right now, everything like that. I'm like, you know what? God had bigger plans for you. You know what I mean? Go ahead. Go ahead. I'm loving this story. I'm just loving this. You, you, you know that God always had a plan for me, dude. He saved me so many different times. Yeah. And he's always taught me certain things that I need to be taught at the times I need to be taught. Um, if, if that never happened to me, I would probably would have still been that ego-driven entrepreneur, right? Uh, and it was all about me. Look at my numbers. Look how many sales I did. Me, 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 me. Now it's completely different than the business that I'm in now. It's about serving, giving them, right? But that bankruptcy humbled me, humbled me. I had to give back the cars. I, 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 I was so prideful 
right? That I wasn't even willing to go to the attorney's office to sign my paperwork or get him. I had him, the attorney, I looked him up online, didn't ask anybody for references, didn't do my due diligence on an attorney. I contacted him via online and I told him, hey, meet me at Starbucks. I'm not going to your office. And he, what do you mean? And I was like, I'm not going to be seen walking into a bankruptcy yeah. office. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. went through that whole deal. Um, that was a rude awakening as well because I, you know, being that I, I, had, I had success in real estate, I accumulated a lot of real estate property. I uh, bought a lot of rental properties. I was flipping a lot of homes. Uh, and then at some point, stand still, I ended up uh, having about eight, eight real estate um, uh, homes that I owned, rentals. Mm -hmm. Um, but they're owned under my LLC. And so when I went to go, you know, the bankruptcy attorney visited me, I said, hey, there's two things I want to protect. Uh, I want to protect my classic cars and I want to protect all my real estate assets. And they're all under this LLC, completely separate from Realty World Associates, completely separate from this S corporation. Can we do this? And he says, yes. Like, no, like, all good. Well, you almost got to be a little weary, yeah. man. When somebody says yes that quick. And I was like, all right, but it's only going to cost you $15,000. So, all right, cool. Wrote him a check for 15000 go through the whole bankruptcy process. Of course, never been through a bankruptcy, so I don't know. Mm -hmm. And I didn't want to tell a soul that yeah. I was going through Yeah, because you're kind of you, you kind of like, like embarrassed and that embarrassment on that. Miguel doesn't yeah. lose, right? And, and for me, going through that process sucked. And giving things back sucked. Um, come to, you know, to the day where they're going to sign off on my bankruptcy, you know, the, the, the judge asked, okay, what's you know, this Aguilar Investment Homes LLC. I was like, oh, those are, are, you know, a corporation that has all my real estate, all my rental properties that I've accumulated over the years, um, and they're, they're protected by that corporation. I said, yes, but you gave a personal guarantee to this building, uh, the building that I, that I got, the commercial building. And I was like, yes. So I was like, all right, so since it's a personal guarantee and you own 100% of that LLC, guess what we have to do? We have to go through the LLC, uh, LLC as well. I had, out of the eight properties, uh, four of them were paid off, and then the other ones had small loans on them. Uh, this is at the starting peak of the real estate off, you know, the real estate takeoff, 2011, 2012. My heart dropped. All, that was my, that was my that, savings, that, that, that was, was my yeah, retirement, that, that was yeah, yeah. I worked my ass off to accumulate over the course of the year, because instead of going and buying, you know, all yeah, the lavish stuff yeah, that yeah, I yeah, wanted, yeah, I yeah. reinvested yeah, back yes. into my real estate. Um, come to find out they went through it. They ended up keeping the four that were paid off and kept over a million dollars in equity to go towards the bankruptcy. If I would have let my pride down and researched it a little bit more, right, I could have negotiated pennies on the dollar of the current situation I was in and not have to ever file bankruptcy. So I, I, I guess the lesson is, man, you, you, can, you know, you know, a lot of times you can't be too prideful. No. You know, I've, I've, I've done that, it butt me in the ass. And you know what, pride is always the thing that just totally destroys us. Yes. Cause you don't ask for help, you don't go out there and seek all that. And you, you know, you just don't want to admit that you lost. You think but, you know it all. but you learn from your, from your losses. You don't learn from your wins. No. You know, you learn from your losses, man. And I've learned to, you know, over the years, I've made the same kind of mistakes, mm -hmm. you know, lost thousands and thousands of dollars. and. Mm -hmm. And, and all that. And I learned that, you know what, man, no matter how bad it is, you know, just to talk about it. And just by talking about it to people, you know, somewhere out there, someone out there has a solution for me Correct. that's better than what I have right now. Correct. And, 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 and that's why I talk about it now, because in all reality, there's probably people out there that are going through a similar situation, but just go and do your research, talk to people, get referrals, understand that there's been other people in your shoes. So you'll get through it. You know, the, you, they, you'll walk through darkness. Like if you stay in that dark spot, you're gonna stay there. But if you know that this is just something that you're gonna pass through and then take it as a very valuable learning situation. And that's what I did. I finally realized after all that, look at what happened. Look at what my pride got me. Look at what my ego got me. How can I change this from ever happening again? Yeah, how come you don't have a book? You gotta have a book, bro. I just, no, I don't mean to interrupt yeah. you, man. I just, I just saw it right now. I mean, I just flashed in front of me. I just see you right now in a cover of book, you know, with you standing there, you know, with your self-made hat on, you know, with, with, with all jacked up, you know, and, and, and just say self-made against all odds. Yeah. You know what I mean? And I mean, I, I'm telling you, man, that is a book that I want to read. Yeah. And it, it would be, and there's a lot of more 
I'm sure. Yeah, that I'm sure. I don't have it even fully. I'm no. I'm sure, yet. man. But it's it's one of those things where this I just don't movie, feel like bro. I'm there yet. It's oh. weird. Like I feel like I'm barely scratching the surfaces. Yes, I've done very well. Yes, I've a- accomplished a lot more than most. But I just don't feel like the time is there yet. But I've been approached about this a few times. You just, I think it would be valuable just um, if I do write a book. Is you're to help never gonna other, be. You're never yeah. gonna be. Ever, you know. You know. You know us. Oh, you know. Nice. You're never gonna be where you want to be. Yeah. You know, because we're always gonna push and go and all that kind of stuff. But I'm telling you, man, I'm inspired. You know, I thought I had it bad. Mm-hmm. You know, what I mean, you know, I had a pretty bad. I had a pretty fucked up life. Yeah. But I'm telling you right now, man, I think you want up me. You know what I mean? <laughs> you want uh, you want up me, man. And, and the thing is, it's um, and there's more, man. I mean, I can go for days and days, and sometimes there's things that I still keep very private, yeah. um, because it's unfortunate of the situations that I was in. Um, I have literally cheated death multiple of times. I've also cheated, you know, probably bankruptcy multiple of times. People just see the success; they don't oh, see yeah. the setbacks. Yeah. But that bankruptcy, I literally, t- literally taught me a lot not to happen. And since then, um, has really brought me back down to earth and understand that everybody could be beat, yeah. you know. And but there's a, yet again the people that come back for more end up winning ten times. Yes, yeah. so, you know it's, it's the old you know Rocky Balboa. Oh, you man. know nobody hits as hard as life. Nah, dude. right. It's, it's not how hard you can hit; it's how hard right, you can dude, get hit and sit back oh, up. You know, time. you know that that's that's, that's like the truth about life, man. Yeah. And God, man. You've been knocked down and knocked out, and you just got back up and just got back up and just got back up. How the hell did you get into fitness now? So I, I, I've always been into wrestling. I've always played football, and I've always tried to lose weight. And I didn't lose it until actually getting into middle school, high school. Um, so health and fitness has always been that outlet for me. It's always been, given that my whole, put it this way. Everybody that's ever loved me or supposedly loved me has turned their back against me. My mother, my father, my family members. The only people that has never let me down, believe it or not, has been my teammates, my football team, my wrestling team. So health and fitness and and the gym, too. Like, you're literally beating your body up. And guess what the result is? You're building this muscle. You're building this uh, endurance and the stamina to go to battle. And life is battle. So it, it, I learned that at a very young age. This is my outlet from keeping me to kill anybody or do do do, do you know go heavily into drugs because I still messed around. We still like I had no parents, so you can imagine the the yeah. trouble that I got into. I just never got caught, yeah. which was you know nice. I got caught a couple times, but never really got yeah. caught. Caught. So health and fitness has always been there. Um, but what really happened after bankruptcy, you know, put us in a situation where now. I had to regroup, I had to redo everything, I had to, I had to restructure my real estate office, I had to restructure my real estate business, and I had to give everything back, went down to one car. You know, I ended up saving enough money. I actually bought Rob Derdick's Tahoe, the Stormtrooper. No he had it on Auto Trader, dude. I went to the Fantasy Factory and everything, bought it cash from him because we gave back the BMWs and whatnot. And then uh, uh, my wife, She's always been an amazing, my wife met me when I had nothing and she's rode this thing out for the last 12 years. We've been married 12 years um, and, and I, put, I put her through highs and lows. Wow. So with her, she understood the lifestyle that we wanted and that we still wanted to obtain. So she, was, she offered, she was like, let me, let, me, let me help out around the house. I was like, I want to start personal training again. And she was already into competing and I was like, all right, you know, go for it. And I was like, all right, where, where are you going to go? So I was like, no, put it in my garage. So three-car garage converted into the first self-made fitness, you know, and we made that her gym. She outgrew it. She was voted best personal trainer in the Inland, in the Inland Empire magazine. I was still selling real estate. Within eight months, we're back up to seven, you know, we saved about $75,000, $80,000 in, 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 in the reserves. We were getting back on our feet. And she outgrew this place. And from there, you don't want to do so much in a garage, right? Yeah. And I was like, and I got tired of people coming. Yeah. To the yeah. I can see that. Stuff, okay, I can right? see that. Yeah. So I finally told her, I was like, why don't you go find somewhere to go? And she ended up finding a car, uh, kickboxing studio to go to. And she went there, uh, sold everything out of the garage. Uh, but within like 60 days or less, they closed this place down out of nowhere. So she had nowhere to go. So I told her, hey, why don't you go to these big box gyms and see if that works out for you? And we know that we know what happened. Yeah, you know, we, we know, know what happens there. Is the devalued? I mean, micromanagement devalued. They don't get paid well. The personal trainers there, and they're the ones impacting people's life. 
Uh, and so she came back every time very disappointed. And, and, and finally, you know, I gave in. I gave her par parameters based on what the market was doing. I said, if you find this type of building with, you know, this dollar per square foot, I'll, I'll build you a gym that you can have somewhere separate from the house. Two days later, she finds it. My like, shit. So it was in Temecula? It was in Marietta. Oh, Marietta. Yeah, Marietta, Temecula. Um, and she found it. And for me, I was like, well, now I got to do what I said, right? In the same process, in the same token, as we're looking at all this, I was like, dude, how many trainers, just like my wife, need a place to go? Need somewhere they can actually be appreciated for what they do. Um, so, uh, you know, the original plan was to build her a gym. And so we got into building the gym. This is where, and, you know, the other aspect of self-made for us is that, look, I just got out of bankruptcy. I have no way of financing, no way of doing anything outside. I saved up about 75,000. Not being in the industry when it comes to the equipment, rubber flooring, paint, the whole nine. Construction, I had it covered, but not like the logistics of, of, of a natural gym, right? I thought 75,000 was way more than enough to open up my first location. And as we start building things out, um, for one, we found the building. The landlord was, nope, got denied right off the bat because of our credit. Yeah. And, and the bankruptcy and I, I wrote him a good letter and I explained to him and I showed him my credit prior so look I've never been late before this was a scenario give me an opportunity to show you I'm a good tenant uh, he was like the only way I'm willing to do it is if you put uh, three, three times the amount in the deposit and you give me first and last month's uh, lease payment that goes that goes like 15 grand right there 25 25 Shit. 25 thousand so I'm down to 50 grand okay <laughs> and I'm like dude Craigslist, every, I got it covered. I can build this gym for 50 grand. But as you know, us, or the attention to detail, my OCD and my ADHD, like literally I, I, everything has to be perfect. Yeah. First impression is everything. And I want people to feel welcome and, wel and, and, and excited to be at Self Made. So everything had a color match, everything. So as I'm going through the whole process, by the time I got to the mirrors and the floors, we're out of money. And I was like, shit, what do I do? Couldn't get no loans, couldn't get any financing anywhere. So I, 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 I had a 1970s Suburban, all laid out. As you can tell, you love cars and we love cars. And, and I, I built that thing from the ground up and it was a badass Suburban. Um, put that up for sale, sold it for 30 grand, got 30 grand there. And then I had a badass uh, Road King that was all customed out. Laid on the floor, dude. It got uh, in Hot Bikes magazine. It was November's issue. So full on decked out uh, motorcycle that I love. So you went all in. You know, you you, you yeah, basically sold your prized possessions yep. for the dream. Yep. And that's what I did. I, I had to, not knowing what the result was going to be. Most people don't do that. No. See, most scared. people don't, most people don't want to risk anything. You know, most people are, you know you know just grab onto stuff. You know, and and so so you started that right. You, you know you so you started it. You know, and then what happened? So. Got it up and going, and then within six months, got my full investment back. Six months. Six months. Dude, so I had from, about one hundred fifty thousand invested. In so, that. so from the beginning, you know, did you get trainers to come over there? You know, so you start advertising. Hey, we're looking for trainers to come in and all that kind of stuff. And that's exactly what we did. We saw there was a problem in the industry. We saw a big problem in the industry. Me physically, my wife. We we we. We didn't know how bad it really was because we thought when we saw the personal trainers at the gym, oh, they're killing it. They're doing what they love. All backwards yeah, yeah, yeah. like literally 95 percent, i would say hate their job mm -hmm. at big garbages but they had nowhere else to go to yeah. that's all they could do some of them had kinesiology degrees some of them are super educated very very good personal trainers but they're getting paid minimum wage while the big box gym is charging the 65 80 dollars per session and they're making 12 yeah. 10 whatever that number may be we saw a huge problem and then looking at what my wife had to go through to try to find a place, uh, whether it be private studios or whatnot. One, if it was a private studio, they're way too small, didn't have all the equipment they needed, very micromanaged, still had to carry their name and, and, and she already built her business. So why would she want to do that? And then you have obviously the big box gyms, that's a devalue 100 percent. So. The value of personal training to me was was huge because I know what it did for me in, in the health and in, uh, fitness industry. But I saw a big problem. And instead of me trying to create something completely you new. You solved the problem. I solved it. I mean, I mean, I mean they say that in, in, in life, you get paid based on the, the big problem that you solve. The bigger the problem you solve, the more money you make, you know. And this has always been in the industry, man. I mean, I remember we had a private conversation about this. You know, when I was coming up, 
you know, when I was going to chiropractic school and, and going to college, I was a personal trainer at a, at a gym where, you know, obviously, you know, I, I trained there, but they took most of the money, yeah. right? But then again, they were paying, they, they were paying the rent. I didn't have to pay the rent. You know, I didn't have to do any marketing and all that kind of stuff, but literally, you know, you know I, I got pennies on the dollar, yeah. right? Basically making a little more than minimum wage, but I was like, oh my God, I'm a trainer. So yeah. it's better than working at McDonald's, but I'm really making the same as what I was making at McDonald's, right? But then one, you know, one day, I mean, it, it, it's this true story, man, true story. I was actually working at Bally's Total Fitness, you know, while I was going to car to school. And true story, you know, there was a guy in Bally's back then, um, they had a woman's section, mm-hmm. you know, we had a woman's section, a woman's little gym, yeah. you know, and so guys weren't supposed to go there. It's like all pink little area or whatever upstairs. This was right off of Fullerton, an, an orange store. Yeah. And I was, I was working there while I was going to chiropractic school. And I guess the guy was, went, went to the woman's section without his shirt and it was lifting, right? It was lifting in, in a woman's section. The manager comes up to me, he goes, Sam, I, was just, I just moved to California, three, four months in California. I was a, I was a Pennsylvania boy. I came up to California and um, I, he said, Sam, you gotta go get the guy out of there. Yeah. I said, okay, you got it. So I went to, told the guy and he was, uh, a guy, you know, just weird looking guy, just, you know, doing like flies like this, you know, with, with like some, some uh, chrome dumbbells, you know what I mean? Like, you know, like this. And I, I said, hey, bro, I said, I can't have you um, in, in the section, man, you gotta go to the men's section. Yeah. And uh, he goes, well, I'm not moving, I wanna work out here. Yeah. I'm like, hey, bro, like, yeah, I'm just telling you the manager, no, I got it, I got it, you understand? So I went back to the manager, the guy wasn't gonna go anywhere. He said, no, I wanna work out here. So I went and told the manager, I said, hey, man, this guy doesn't wanna move. This doesn't wanna... He goes, Sam, I need you to get him. Get him out of there. He cannot be in the woman's section. So I went to the, I went back over there. He wasn't there. I went back to the manager. I said, he's not there. He goes, you need to find him. I need to escort him out. Wow. And I said, okay, I'll go find him. So I finally went in there, trying to look at him everywhere, and I found him in the uh, men's locker room. Mm-hmm. So I found this guy in the men's locker room, and I said, hey, bro, I got to escort you out. Yeah. So he goes, all right. So I'm escorting him out. You know, I've got him grabbed by his arm. I'm, I'm walking him out. Miguel, I wish I was making this up. He had a little bag, and all of a sudden, when I was escorting him out, I, I grabbed him by his arm. He dropped his bag. All of a sudden, he comes in. He got, he get into a karate kid stand. I swear to God, it was you know what I mean. It's like he went whoa yeah, like this, yeah. like this, like he was like, I'm like, I'm fresh in California. I yeah, heard yeah. California people are crazy, you know, like, you know all that yeah, shit yeah, like this, yeah. this and that. So my first my first instinct was, this guy is probably some killer karate guy, whatever yeah, yeah. this and that. I ain't know anything, you know. I just fucking tackled him. I just tackled him and I just slammed him. Yeah. You know what I mean? And then, you know, the guy comes in and all the manager comes up. What happened? I'm like, dude, like this guy, like, mm-hmm. trying. Long story short, you know, I got fired. Yeah. You know, I got fired from Bally's, and I'm like, I got these clients and all this and that. So I went to um, uh, Milos Sarsheva's uh, powerhouse gym in Fullerton. Yeah. Went over there with a client. Pay, started paying the rent. That's when I started learning entrepreneurship. Yeah. You know, and and that's how I started. Now, wait a second, I gotta start learning how to market. But it was hard because most trainers, they're great trainers, but they don't know how to market. They don't know the business side of it. And that's where they lose. And what I love about what you do is that you actually have an academy. You actually show these people that, yeah, okay, you can be a trainer. You actually teach them how to market, teach them how to sell. You provide all the tools for them yeah. to be able to be successful. It's not like, okay, well, here's a gym, pay me rent, yeah. and, and that's it. You provide all the tools because you understand that the more successful they are, the more successful you are. So you kind of are married to their success. So yet again, learning from my back real estate you know, office of all is about my production, look at me, look at me, look at me. This time I completely flopped it. I did a complete reverse of what to do in business. And I said, okay, let me serve you and see you succeed. And in return, I'll get the success out of it as well. We're providing career opportunities. We're not providing a job. Yes. Completely different pr- approach, completely different dynamic, and it's, a lot more rewarding. Yeah, I mean, there's a bunch of a bunch of gyms that people can go pay rent. Oh, and that's the thing. It, even I knew for a fact by just putting the original was putting the gym together, let them you know pay rent and let them use it and carry their own name and have them branded, co-brand with us, and, and build a relationship partnership with these guys as independent contractors. But then I started noticing that a lot of these trainers don't have that mindset. No, they, didn't. They, they, didn't. they come from an employee mindset, which is good if you like being that employee, yeah. but if you want to lead and run your own business, it's completely different. Yeah. 
So we, we noticed that very early on and I, I was like, oh, I'm really good at marketing. I'm really good at promoting and showing the value behind of what we do. Not so much of look at me, look at me. No, look at the value, look at the results, look at what we're doing. I provided the, you know, the online apps, the nutrition app, the training app, the academy that gives them these skill sets to run an efficient business with us. Anybody can give you a key. Yeah. Say, hey, good luck to you, wish you the best. But no one will really give you the time. And the time, if, if you really think about it, whether they're making 150000 or 200000 with us or even 20000 with us as independent contractors, I still give them the same uh, uh, value back. In other words, they get my undivided attention to help them succeed, whether they're making money or not, because in all reality, they're going to make money. Well, you know what? You know what I love about you as a CEO? You're very hands-on. Yes. You know, you're very hands-on. You're very approachable. You, you, you know, you're very uh, within reach. Mm -hmm. You know, and um, you know, I, you know, I talk to a lot of the trainers and all that kind of stuff. And every time your name comes up, mm -hmm. everybody's like, you know, everybody has the utmost most respect for you. So you're you are a CEO who's in the trenches with them, understand them, and you understand that. You know, it's not, you know, you're developing them. You're, you're teaching them to be entrepreneur. And I see, you know, you know, I see that you hold seminars and, and you bring out speakers for them and all that kind of stuff. And that's what's so different about what you're doing. You know, that look, I've been in both, I've been on both ends. I am on the other side. I'm on the other side and I get it. I mean, you know, and it's so funny because we were talking about it earlier. You know, a lot of people are like, well, isn't, you know, self-made a, a competitor to you? Or I'm sure you probably get the same yeah. thing, you know, that kind of stuff. I'm like, there's no, com there's different types of businesses. Yeah. And one business is good for one person. Another business is good for one second. You know, at the end of the day, we're here to change lives. Yeah. We're here to change people. And there's no, for me, there's not never been a competition. There's never been a scarcity minded. There's only so many people, man. Look, man, mm -hmm. you know, flash, you know, you know, this is this news flash, man. Yeah. America is getting bigger. Yes. America is unhealthy. Yes. You know, people are sitting behind a desk eating junk. Yep. You know, they're going to need fitness. Some people yep. are going to want to go here. Some people want to go here, you know, and and we're going to be able to serve everybody. It's, yep. it's competition, not competition. Yes. You know, I have nothing but utmost respect mm -hmm. for what you're doing, what you're creating. And when I saw what you're creating, I'm like, wow. It's almost like, why did I think about that? Because yeah. that is a void in the market. Yeah. That is a void in the market. I've been there. I remember being at Bally's yeah. and being at 24s and all that kind of stuff. And I didn't have a place to go. The only reason I went somewhere because I got fired There's something I didn't have any control of. Yeah. You know, the guy told me to kick him out. The guy tried to like do karate chop me and I, yeah. you know, and I slammed him. It, it, now you got fired because of yes. you know, And that's the thing. It's like. No one ever tried to perfect what we did, and I'm trying to chase perfection. I've said this multiple times when, when it comes to perfection. There's nothing in this world that is perfect, nothing. But if you're constantly chasing it, you're always evolving. You're sharpening your tools, you're getting better, you're evolving and progressing forward. You're becoming a student of a life that you're never gonna be stagnant. You're never gonna be complacent, you're never gonna be settled. There's always more to do, and there's more value to bring to everything that we're doing. Like, what we're doing now, it, it, it's going to blow people away. We, we haven't even, we, we're just getting warmed up. From the tools and systems that we already currently have, now we're evolving from that. But you're just in the infancy right now. You know, I mean, look at what you have done in such a short amount of time. You're just a baby when it comes to this kind of stuff. When it comes to, I can't even imagine what you're going to do next year, next two years, mm -hmm. next five years. I can see a self made training facility in every town in America. So every town in America needs it. Every town in America, there's people that need to be trained. There's people that need to, to, to lose weight and get in shape. And there are people, there are trainers that need a place to train them. Not only a place to train them, but a tra to be able to develop into entrepreneurs and, and develop into business people and legitimize the training industry. Yes. And in, 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 in all reality, we're, we're impacting through health and fitness. We found both of us between the camp, between self-made, like literally that's what we're doing. And in return, we get financially rewarded for it. How is it, how, 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 I know I can sleep at night knowing the fact that I'm giving everything I possibly can for these trainers to be successful. And that also we're providing, now we're up to over a thousand trainers, okay, between our, our 21 locations, give or take. Um, these are 20, you know, over a thousand people that are putting food on their table, but not only that, they're actually living. Yeah, and they're impacting and people's lives. They're changing impacting, people's lives. yes. Like, literally, it saved my life. You know, it, I, you know, I got sobriety from self-made training facility. We've talked about this before, where knowing my background, where I come from, of course I, I, I drank, and of course I dabbled in, in drugs. I didn't dabble, I did drugs. I was a functioning drug addict, alcoholic. I made a lot of money bought more drugs. 
I, I, I almost was gonna on the verge of destroying my life. And self-made training facility, the first year we opened, right? The first year we had the success and we're already on our second location, on the verge of our second location in Corona. Um, I had one last binger last weekend of just pure drinking and, and just destroying my life over the weekend. This was when? This was four years ago, almost four years Damn, ago. Damn, recently. Yeah. Like, okay, okay. So, so with self-made training facility, I was promoting health and fitness. I was promoting success through entrepreneurship, but yet I lived a double life. I had a demon that I couldn't kick, and that was drugs and alcohol. And that made me feel like a hypocrite. And I can't lead by example feeling like a hypocrite because when I have these podcasts or these conversations or I'm trying to promote this other trainer to be successful, but yet on the weekends I disappear for a couple of days because I'm drinking or I'm doing, uh, doing drugs and disappearing from my family too, mentally, physically, completely gone. But then you'll show up back Monday, like pretend nothing happened and just work my ass off. I, I did that for so many years and eventually it was going to get caught up to me. Yeah. And, and after Father's Day weekend, uh, June 19th, uh, I decided to, to, to stop. I was very fortunate that nothing happened, but self-made training facility provided that, that awakening in me. I, I can't do this to myself. I'm going to lose it all. I'm helping other people to be successful. This is a lot more valuable than the money. So I need to take care of me first Absolutely. so I can take care of others. So, you know, that, that's why another reason I love health and fitness. Gosh, man. I mean, what, a, you know, I know that, you know, wow. Yeah, I'm, I'm blown away, bro. I'm blown away. I'm blown away by what you have achieved, what you have overcome. You know, gosh, man, I can't, like I said, I, can, I mean, I, you need that book, man. Yeah. I mean, it, it is, this is a movie, yeah. you know, because I mean, like, you can't even make this shit up. And that's, it, it, that's why it's so fluent. It's so easy to, to and it's actually therapeutic talking about it, believe it or not. Because yeah. um, I held it in for so many years that it, 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 it was eating me up inside. And now when I talk about it, I, I want people to understand there's, there's a way out, you know, yeah. it, but it all starts and ends with you, yeah. 100%. So tell me, so right now you're 21 locations, yeah. you know, I know that, you know, there's so many people are approaching you. And I mean, I can just see, I can just see probably over a hundred in the next year or so, yeah. you know, what's, what's next? What, what, what's next? What, what, what are the big projects and what's next for self-made and, and what are you doing, man? I'm, I'm very interested. I'm watching you every single day and yeah. smiling from the sideline, man. Yeah, I, I yeah. love what, to watch you, watch you succeed. And likewise, likewise. you know, we, 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 uh, we feed off of each other. Cause I've, I've come to you a couple of yeah. times and, and we've spoken, you know, privately of certain things and, and, and that, that, that's a mutual feeling. So, yeah. you know, Sam. But uh, what's next for us is obviously the goal is to get to 50 franchises uh, within our five years. We're going to surpass that within oh, the next two months. Oh, gosh, man. I, you, um, 100%. And, and we're being very strategic. I actually had to stop selling franchises to catch up and to develop the next big project that we got coming on that's going to be very interactive. Uh, we've talked about it before, all the back end training and training and training to get these guys to really be successful. So, so that's getting launched here within the next 90 I'm so days. Glad, I'm so glad you're disciplined enough to do that. Because yeah. I remember we, we made a mistake of not doing that, yes. you know, and and uh, we learned from it, yeah. you know, and it takes a very disciplined approach like you have mm -hmm. to say, hey, man, I'm not going to accept any money right now. Yeah. I'm going to, you know, just make what I have better mm -hmm. so I can accept more money later on. Yeah. And that's a great move where a lot of people didn't know. Well, we, when we got, we didn't get, we got into franchising by accident. Yeah. <laughs> we you started growing, you know, by accident. Yeah. And they said, okay, what are we going to do next now? Yes. You know what I mean? You know, so we're learning as we go. We made some mistakes. And I'm glad that to see that you're yeah. avoiding some of that. And, and it, because I learn from people yeah. that, that I speak to. Like, I, I, I mimic the great to be great, but I create my own. Yeah. You know, I create my own path on that aspect. Mm -hmm. And that's where I feed off of like-minded individuals so I can get those ideas or those visions of what I need to do next. I study a lot, believe it or not. Like I, I research and look up things that I want to accomplish and how I can accomplish it by their mistakes. Yeah. And they're good mistakes because they're still successful people, but it's just like, okay, they did if this. If you can avoid a bump on a well, road, this way, you're at 100 plus locations, right? Yeah. That's where I want to be. So why would I not want to kind of either mimic or kind of follow that lead, but make it our own and in, in, in our own thing, right? Success in schools. Uh, 100%. Uh, and, and so for us is obviously the 50 franchises and some, we've already allocated about $10 million for the state of Texas. Uh, we're going to do one great, master corporation. That's a great yeah. state, yeah. man. That's Texas a great is going to be state. huge for huge. us. Huge. Um, and then from there, Florida, and we're already in five different states and growing. Arizona is going to be another big state for yeah. us because there's so many high uh, profiled cities that need a self-made as well. 
And in, in Southern California, we're not done yet. You know, you got all of LA County. We just uh, broke our first LA County, which is West Covina. And then from there, we're gonna go to Burbank and then from there on and on and on. So LA County can easily do four or five franchises. Yeah, one of my friends is gonna be a trainer at uh, West, Covina. West Covina. Yeah, West Covina, you know, you know, you know Chris, Chris is gonna yep. be there, you know that. One of my franchisees, yep. you know, one of my, my business partner is, you know, inquiring about open up a self-made, he was yep. telling me about that. I'm just so happy and, I, and, I, and it's so funny because for me, I think self-made is the next progression to camp. Yeah. You know, you know where we, when, when people come, I mean, you know, um, Gosh, man, I think, I think, I honestly think that where there can be a camp, there can be a self-made right next to it, you know, and, you know, you know, that, you know, it's, it's, it's one, you know, you know, it's funny. Let me, let me, let me share something with you. I don't even know if you know that. Do you know my business partners train at self-made chino oils? You know that? I've watched them. Yeah, yeah. My business partners, you know what I mean? Because people don't understand, like, you know, I think we were talking about it earlier is that, is that, um, you know, we can't, I can't work out at a camp. Yeah. I'm sure you can't work out at a self-made. Yeah. You know, look, it's like, I had to realize, man, my work is my work. Yeah. You know, my gym time is my gym time yeah. and my home time is my home time. Yeah. And when you start cross-referencing and, 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 and mixing them together is when you get in trouble. Yeah. You know, I can't bring my work home because I'm gonna have my wife all over me. Yeah. Even when I work, now you're gonna work from home, yeah. right? And whenever I went to the camp, mm -hmm. it was for me, it was a guaranteed fucked up day. Yeah. You know why? Because I get to the camp, and I'm trying to work out. I only have so much time to work mm -hmm. out because I got to go to work. Mm -hmm. And, you know, obviously people want to come talk to me, you know, have a question and all that. And next thing you know, the two hours later, I've done like two sets, yeah. right? And next yeah. thing you know, I'm like, I didn't get anything done. So I'm like, oh my God, I didn't, I didn't do that. And next thing you know, I don't know about you, you know, I'm such a OCD, you know, person. Now, when I went to the camp, all I saw was flaws. You start picking up, you put things back. Yeah, you're like, man, I was like, your oh, workout like, is your your, bro, your upkeep of your bro, facility like, because you get again because you take pride in ownership. You know, so it's it's in that we were talking about that earlier. It's it's difficult. You know, we get and, and of course if we get stopped by some of our, our uh, employees or or trainers, uh, you want to you want to give them information. You want to give them your time. So you never want to neglect that. But then at the end of the day, when you neglect yourself like that, then it becomes a fucked up day. Yeah, yeah. And I have this regimen where you know no matter what. I train at exactly the same time every day. That hour and a half is mine. And I'm currently doing it at my facilities, but we were talking about earlier, it's like I might have to go somewhere else because of, of, of that environment. You wanna be able to be available to them and not hurt yourself. Get ready, yes. get ready to go somewhere else and well, get started, all kinds of questions, man. Well, I started jujitsu somewhere else, yeah. you know, and, and uh, that's been a blessing in so many ways because it, it's almost like wrestling and it's a stress reliever and it's separate from what I'm doing, so it doesn't feel like work. Once you go to a big box gym, yeah. you know, I remember when I went to a big box gym, you know, and I walked in, I got approached by trainers, hey man, you know, we know who you are, you know, uh, you're, you're here to solicit clients and this and that, my dude, I don't train people at my own gym, man. Yeah, yeah. I'm, just, I'm, I'm trying to, it's, you know, I'm, it's five o'clock in the morning, man, I got my headphones on, I don't want to talk to nobody, man, I'm not trying to solicit clients, yeah. I'm trying to train, man, leave me the F alone, and that's right? that's what I'm afraid of, if I go to these oh, big bro, it's going to happen, gonna man. Red flag me and yeah, I'm, I'm out Yeah, of it's going to happen. You might want to have a prior conversation with the owner, you know, with a gym manager or whatever, but like, hey man, this is who I am, yep. it's what I do, I'm here to work out, yep. just let me know, just don't let, let your staff know not to bother me, right. or I will get my lawyer on your yeah, ass, yeah, <laughs> you right. know, faster than, we, faster than your turn head can spin, you know what I mean? They don't even understand, it's like we, we're, our mentality is completely by far uh, different than most, you yeah. know, and we're there to understand that we're there to take care of ourselves, and in, re in all reality, there's plenty of business for everywhere, but I think what happens with people like that, for instance, right, whether it be the big box gyms or just other entrepreneurs or like this relationship, when they see that there's insecurities within their own business, I realized two years ago, right, not to worry about what everybody else is doing, but worry about what I'm doing. That self-confidence has developed a success in the last two years because I know for a fact we are 10, I mean, two, three years ahead of everybody that is trying to either copy us uh, and 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 also understand that the value that I'm putting out, you can't compete. You know, one of the best lessons, believe it or not, you know, that I've learned was from Floyd Mayweather. You know, in the interview, and as, you know, as ignorant as Floyd is, man, I have to say that. You know, you know, as as as, as, as ignorant as, as he is, and as cocky as he is, you know, he dropped a, a nugget one time, yeah. and I was like, oh my God! I remember they were interviewing him, yeah. you know, and um, you know, and I, I'm very close with his cousin, yeah. you know, and I, and I, you know, they're interviewing him, and they're like, you know, did you watch, you know, Canelo's tape? 
you know, you know, did you watch what he used? Canelo was like breaking people's ribs and this and that. He goes, I don't watch any of my opponents tape. I don't, I don't, I don't know what he does. You know, you know, he, he said, Canelo's going to, you know, you know, Canelo said he's going to come straight forward and he's going to do this and he's going to that. And he goes, Flo goes, look, man, I don't know what he's going to do. Yeah. All I know is what I'm going to do. Yep. Yep. So I don't know what he's going to do. You know, and, and, and isn't that life all about? You don't know what, you can't control the circumstances. You just can control you. Right. It, it, it's so, so true. Like, it's good to be, a, like, have awareness yes. of what the industry yes. is doing and what your, 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 your next moves are going to be. But don't worry about that person. When you focus on that, it becomes very, it, look at, um, I'm reading The Art of War right now. Yeah, I love that book. Amazing book, yeah. right? Uh, I, I'm not done with it yet, but so far what I've gathered for it, and it's like I posted it on my story the other day. This book is like you should think, everybody should think this book because it's keeping me from really destroying you, right? Because in all reality, there, there's so much business out there that you, there's a, a, an approach to that, that if you follow those, those principles, you will be successful. You know, there's strategic ways of doing things. Communication wins everything. Value wins everything. And constantly striving for that will never put you complacent. And you're always going to be one step of everybody else. The people that worry about their whole surroundings or their competition or what that is, um, they're only set to fail. Because that, ne that energy is negative energy towards something that's not going to benefit your company. Be aware, but don't, don't pay attention. You know, one of my mentors says this. He goes, jets don't have rear view mirrors. You know, you know, they don't, don't know who's behind them. They're just too busy not running over somebody. Yeah. You know what I mean? So there's no rear view mirror who's behind me and all that kind of stuff because they know they go straight forward. And that's how we think, yeah. you know. And there was, that, there was that meme, I think it was a Michael Phelps. Yeah. You know what I was talking about? One, you know, the best one, the guy that he's competition is trying to figure out where he's at. He's already ahead. You know what I mean? He's ahead of you. I mean, he ain't trying to look back. When you're so laser focused. Yeah right and you're so laser focused and you have an end game and you're strategically placing yourself for that end game there's nothing really it's like like driving these fast ass cars if you go so fast everything just got <laughs> right you, there's no time you know it, 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 that's the zone that we're in it's dude. so true man you know we, you know for four years i drive a scion xp yeah you know after that whole real estate crash and things like that man even though i could afford whatever car you know i was like i'm not, I'm not buying anything i was so jaded you know and i was like i whenever i saw a car i was like oh my god like it was almost like i was like you know salivating you know and i remember you know when i kind of get on the get on the on-ramp you know, I had to look to see what's coming because no matter what I did, that car couldn't get out of its own way. So I had to look. With, with these cars, man, you know, I just know if I jump on it, yeah. get on the on-ramp, I don't have to. I don't. I don't have to look in the mirror. I know I'm ahead of everybody. Yep. You know, so um, I know exactly what you mean. And that's what entrepreneurs do. We just yeah. full steam ahead. Yeah. And I can't tell you how proud I am of you. I can't tell you how much your friendship means to me, mm -hmm. you know, and, and I have nothing but utmost respect for you because you exemplify, you know, the 1%, you know, that's what I stand for. Every, you know, I've been saying I, I want to become a one percenter, mm -hmm. you know, ever since I was like in my mid twenties. And for me, one percent, it's not about money. It's not about that. It's about the mindset. Yeah. It's about the mindset. And to me, you know, you, you know, you have your faith, yeah. you have your family, yeah. you have your fitnesses, you have your finance, and you're having a blast doing it. You work all day, but you're having fun. And you always said, hey, you know, you, earlier you said, this stuff is fun. Yeah. This is not work. I get paid to lift weights, dude. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I get, in all reality, I get paid to lift weights. I get paid to motivate other people to be successful. I get paid to But don't be a plumber, right? Yeah, you, 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 had, you, had, you, you were a plumber, right? Yeah. You know what fucking work is. Yeah, this ain't dude. work. Oh, dude, I always tell people, it's like, I always ask them too, if they're having a hard day or they, they, they're, they're bitching about the, the most minuscule things ever, right? I always ask them, I was like, do you know what a shovel feels like? And they're like, what do you mean? I was like, have you ever dug a trench? And I was like, in, in 110 degree weather up in Indio, have you ever dug a trench? you know, that has to be scaled over and over for eight, 10 hours a day. That's work, yeah. that's manual labor. This is fun shit, you're, yeah. you're making it too difficult. Yeah. You know, enjoy the process, understand that, yeah, this, this is not, it's gonna be easy because everybody would be able to do it, right? This is what you're gonna be able to surpass. Wow. So it, it's, um, it's an amazing journey, dude. You know, entrepreneurship, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, you know, change it for the world. Um, one thing that I always wanna get, get my point across is understanding that um, 
through social media, through these platforms, they see us, they see the cars, they see all the nice things, but in all reality, how long did it take to get there? They don't like, see the bankruptcies. No, they don't they, see- they, they, they don't see the sleepless nights. No, and, they, don't, they, they don't see, you know, you know, they're taking your cars oh, and, you know, dude, you know your family see, savings. Like, they don't my, see all that though. My cars, my wife's, you can ask my wife, it's an embarrassing as hell and it happened at 24 Hour Fitness, her car got repossessed while through the bankruptcy because we're trying to hold on to it for a little bit longer. And, and imagine that. Come out 24 hour fitness and the car's gone. Gone, you know? So all those things, people need to understand that we've gone through situations. I know you had your story as well with, with a, a, a couple of close calls, right? But it, it, in all reality is um, look at what we've done and, and how long it took. Patience is key. Invest back into your companies. I mean, literally, we need to, to, to understand as, as, as one that this has developed over the next 20 years, you know? It didn't happen in the last two years. And every job we've ever had, we did it to the fullest because we knew that it was gonna set us up for something later. Yeah. You know, most people don't do that. They, they half-ass everything waiting for that golden ticket. And that golden ticket's never gonna be there. I, I tell my staff and everybody around me, everybody that's, you know, here, to everyone that I tell, I'm like, you know what, you do everything at 100%. Because mm -hmm. what that does, that develops muscles yeah. for you to do everything. You can't say, well, I just work for Sam, I just work for Miguel, so I'm gonna do half-ass right now. But when I get my own gig, mm -hmm. you know, I'm gonna do 100%. No, when are you gonna go, you're gonna half-ass shit too. So you're, gonna, you're either 100% on everything you do or you're half-assing every fucking thing. One way you do one thing is one way, way you do everything. We know that. Yeah, and yeah. I've been, I do the same with my guys. You know, the people that are working with, with us right now, with my, my Dean, my, my CEO. Now he's an amazing guy, man. Amazing Shout guy. out to Dean. Yeah, big, big ups to yeah, him. Yeah. He helps me run this company yes. from Riley doing our, our, our social Very media. Very personable guy, man. Um, I'm telling these individuals that you do this as if it was your company. Because yeah. guess what? One day, eventually, you're either going to be working really high in the, in the company or you're going to develop something for yourself. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's what I love about you. You know, you, you, you genuinely are there to develop people, you know, and you 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 set the standard and you set the pace. You lead, or you were leading from the front, yeah. you know, and I, and I appreciate that about you, man. I, I appreciate you taking the time to come into the podcast, yeah. you know, and, and so just tell me really quick, mm -hmm. you know, if I'm interested in opening my own self-made, yeah. you know, if I'm interested in for the business opportunity, yeah. where do I go? Go to selfmadetrainingfacility.com. There's a tab there where you can fill out the franchise information and be able to to really uh, understand what we offer. But then it gives us a, a full on uh, contact information for me or my staff to contact you. Primarily it's me. I'm okay. very hands meticulous, on, yeah. hands on, and I'm very selective who to bring on. We could have sold 50 of these already. Yeah. Um, but yeah, selfmadetrainingfacility.com. They can fill it out, uh, fill out the franchise information there, and then we can get in contact. Awesome, Miguel. I really appreciate you. I appreciate your story, man. Thank you for coming on the show. Thank God you. God bless, man. I appreciate you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.